Okay. I think so welcome to the panel on the future of software integration. Uh, the idea is that this is not a closed panel, but if someone was has some question in the audience or wants to share something or uh, answer maybe some of the questions we have here, it's uh, completely open. Just uh, request access and I can give you access to the panel or maybe we can interact with the chat or we have also the Slack channel, the Camel Slack channel. And let's start by presenting who is here. So I don't know in which order do you see the panelists, but I'm going to start with Omar, Omar Al Safi. Hello. He's uh, an Apache Camel PMC member, uh, the Bessium contributor and occasional contributor of other open source projects like Apache Kafka. He is currently working as an open source software engineer at Talent. Say hi. Um, we also have Christina Lin here. She is a technology evangelist and has worked on software integration in close contact with users from different environments, finance, telecom, manufacturing. She is currently working as a technical marketing manager for Red Hat Middleware Integration Products. Hi, welcome. We have Margara Tejera. She is a product manager at Carto, formerly a researcher in 3D editing algorithms and visualization. After working for two years in the solutions team at Carto, she's now focused on evolving their data and analysts, uh, analytics tools to make your spatial data easier to manage, analyze, and understand. And Hello. finally, we have. Hi. And finally, we have Gunnar Morling. Uh, he's a software engineer and open source enthusiast by heart. He's leading the Devesium project, a platform for change data capture. Uh, Gunnar is a Java champion, uh, the spec lead for bin validation 2.0, and has founded multiple open source projects such as Mapstruct. So yeah. the first thing we are going to do is just ask a question to each of the panelists to warm up a bit the discussion and allow you to know them a bit better because this short description I just read may be a bit cold to understand uh, the kind of things they do and the kind of things they are experts at. So let's start with Unar. Um, so how does uh, change data capture help with data integration? Huh. So how much time do I have for that one? <laughs> um, uh, one minute, two minutes. <laughs> we got <it> all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I can do 30 minutes. Uh, no, I, <laughs> just to give a background, so change data capture, what it means really for folks who are not aware of it. It's a tool which allows you to get change events out of your database, extracting them from the transaction log of your database, and then stream them into messaging infrastructure such as Apache Kafka, for instance. So that's what people um, used to be using most of the time with. And well, it can be used for data integration really because, well, it gets the data changes out of your database whenever there's a new record or something's updated or something's deleted, and it puts it to Kafka, and then you can connect all kinds of consumers to it. So you can use those change events to update your data warehouse, your search index, your cache. People use it to integrate different microservices. Um, there's a pattern which we call the outbox pattern. Maybe we can talk about that later on. So for exchanging data between microservices. And really, I would say it's like a Swiss army knife of data exchange, data integration. And um, well, the Beesium, um, which I'm working on, imp implements this in an open source um, fashion so people can use it. Thank you. So now we can go to Margara. Um, so what is the biggest challenge you're currently facing at Carto when it comes to integrations? Because I know Carto is focused on spatial data, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if everyone knows what Carto is. So Carto is a platform. I mean, we offer many things, but you know, actually it's like a location intelligence platform. And we offer curated data, we offer anal analytical capabilities, and we also offer visualization uh, tools, let's say, that's in a nutshell. So I guess the, it's a difficult question, but I guess the most challenging thing that we are 
um, dealing with is the increased popularity of the cloud vendor solutions. So I guess we have to deal with the fact that no one um, manages their own databases anymore and that everything is in like Google Cloud, Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, and I think a good indicator for us has been the fact that uh, we used to, to install like, our own premises solutions in, in the client's infrastructure. And this is not the case anymore. Like all of the installations that we do of Carto are um, running in Amazon and of course Google Cloud Platform, etc. So I guess the, the first step that we did towards um, sort of dealing with this new situation is going where the data is. So if data is in Google Cloud Platform, we are now um, offering uh, Carto in the Google Cloud Marketplace. So people can find us where their data is, basically. Well, I, I can go on as well as Gunnar, like forever. <laughs> Another thing, of course, like, and this is probably something which is more connected to the talk, like we have also increased our connectivity um, offering, let's say, so we're, you know, developing connectors with BigQuery, Redshift, et, et cetera. And probably ultimately, I think that we need to like change the paradigm and instead of um, asking people to bring their data in Carto, which is essentially like a Postgres database with PostGIS extension, it's probably going to be uh, going where the data is and probably running all of our location intelligence capabilities directly in the in the cloud, you know, in the but in the infrastructure of Amazon and, and Google, etc. So let's see. Yeah, the, the, having different um, providers for services and uh, different providers for storage, I think that's that's a very difficult uh, yeah. to solve with integration. Especially and, especially uh, now that the data volumes are increasing so so much it's not you know you can't use the same infrastructure for for everything now yeah if it fits in your hard disk that's not big data that's <laughs> so christina hi uh you have been hi. searching how a serverless integration ledger could work would that be the solution to hybrid cloud integrations wow Right. Let's pass it on to God. Yeah. No. <laughs> you took that one. No, just kidding. All right. So, uh, yeah, so that's a lot of, uh, as so you have to look at it in a lot of aspects, right? Because there's a lot of parties involved. You've got DevOps, you've got devs, and in devs, you've got, you know, the, the in-house developers, and you also got integration developers, right? So in a hybrid cloud environment, if you're running serverless or whether you're running serverless or not, you want to make sure that you're operating in the same kind of platform, because we all know that if you're doing Google, if you're doing as if you're doing Azure, if you're doing Amazon, every one of their interface is different, right? So how do you have a, so having to, um, you know, enable those people, telling people how to learn this type of technology is very costly. So we want to make sure that, you know, the first component that we want to have is to have a unified platform for all these DevOps to understand and operate on top of that. So that's like the first aspect. So whether or not, if you're doing serverless, you have to have that. And for the devs, it's a different story, right? So because we're doing, if you take a look at what dev is doing, something that they need, first of all, is the data, right? Um, and, the, and then the second one is the services that we, they want to interact with. So that's like in-house, day-to-day, the dev person, what they want to know. So whether it's serverless or not, um, so with like, how do we do the hybrid cloud store, uh, solutions on top of like the uh, the data? So like we have, we can we can utilize how the Kafka. Uh, something that we kind of use to streamline and you know share the events across uh, different clouds. And another one to do is using uh, the Bezier we're going to just said before to uh, extract the data from database and using Kafka to actually um, uh, uh, spread the data or events around in a real time manner, right? And the other one is you know making sure that you're able to call the services. Uh, so for developer, they don't really need to know if they're like in the same cloud or not. So they should be able to freely call the services to be able to discover the services. So something that they need to know in the hybrid cloud. And then we have the serverless aspect 
Um, so that's the ability to quickly having your application running and then scale down to zero when, or optimize the resource consumption for when. So um, Camel K is the perfect uh, technology that does it because it simpl simplifies ways for you to um, create your application, especially for the integration developers, because they need to interact with hundreds and hundreds of services outside. They can be in different protocols, they can be in different formats. So you still have those like um, traditional enterprise solutions and problems you need to solve, right? So you need to do that. So Camel kind of does it, it, it kind of, uh, so the developer, what they need to do is simply write the code they want to connect. And then using the operator patterns, uh, where Camel K uh, provides that can simply uh, push their applications on top of um, the cloud environment, whether it's hybrid or not. And then um, uh, the Knative side on the story will then uh, enables that serverless capabilities without them having to um, do a lot of configurations. So that's my answer. Okay. That's a long So I got lots Sorry. of follow-up questions for you on that one, but I will keep that for later. Um, <laughs> Just uh, uh, let me ask something to Omar, so he can. I'll kind of ask to ask uh, questions to each other. That that's completely fine. No, that's not pass through me. So Omar, hi. Uh, you have been involved in the transformation of middleware to reactive middleware, which is really important if we want it to be fast with uh, Kafka, Debesium, Camel K. So how is the reception of this? Reactive integration software. How are people taking it? <laughs> it's just, uh, I would say it's very interesting because I would assume everyone here knows Camel. Of course, we know the VSIM from Gona. I <laughs> the the biggest challenge I would say it's always the people. I mean, the the, the technological expect. I mean, people would love to use these technologies, but the problem is I would say the organization. That's always the problem is because. Introducing this uh, this kind of technologies and try to train the people's mindset that you know we are now we have we have these integrations we have these small microservices we have the, the visa we have Kafka here and there it takes a lot of effort and this is one of I would say the challenges I have seen previously in my previous companies that how can people accept and how people could you know uh, train themselves uh, to go with this kind of path because. You know, it's, it's a normal evolution. People used to have this monolith kind of approach. They used to have this, uh, I don't know, like a big bicycle. And then, and now we have like, I don't know, hundreds of microservices applications that are like spreading around in Kubernetes, which that doesn't work. So I would say it's always, it's, it's the organization problem. And then slowly with some, you know, Coaching and you know some awareness about the bounded context and and, and all those laws, it, it it can be get slow for those people to get introduced to these kind of technologies. I would say it makes a bit more complex to uh, build this um, framework infrastructure or whatever you need. I mean, uh, from my opinion, is as I said, like technology expects it could be achievable but the problem is it could be always the organization that's the issue so you could hit uh, especially if you're a big company that's not an easy task that you would do overnight that has like whole whole backlog of organization that you have to go through so that was a thing that i have perceived it as many companies as well I mean, I, I guess that's, uh, but actually where technologies like Kafka are really helpful, I suppose, because, um, well, what I see in the community, sometimes people speak about this democratization of data. So essentially, they set up event streams or data streams without even knowing who, well, you know, which kinds of consumers uh, exist, or maybe they, they consumers, they even exist yet when you set up this change event stream. And maybe then you have some sort of catalog and you can see, okay, which kinds of um, data streams even exist in my enterprise. And then, you know, other or the parts of the organization can come and subscribe to that. And I feel this kind of decoupled thinking just really helps with this kind of problem you described. Definitely it helps. I mean, I mean this is one of the best things that I love in about and Kafka. Those two, and now with Camel, those three, they really, they really help a lot in this kind of scenarios. I mean, in Microsoft, I wouldn't say Microsoft, as the one I said, democratizing the data in the organization. This is, I would say, the future goes in that side because now services are just too much, I would say, and then you have data all, all over. So, yeah.
Can I ask a question to Christina? Uh, yes, I think Sanja yes. just appeared, but I don't know why here. Hi, oh, Sanja, finally. Hi, I'm so sorry about that. I had a lot of difficulty, my internet cut out, but it's exciting because, you know, of course the internet would cut out at a technology conference, so. Yes, it's important. Sometimes we don't realize that uh, having to having an online conference is, is good because we can reach further to people that couldn't travel. But if you are not having a good internet connection, then you're completely out. That's it. Yes. So Sanja, for those of you who doesn't know her, she's a product leader at MuleSoft, a Salesforce company where she works on the developer tooling product lines. Her passion is help users utilize APIs to connect to their most crucial systems. So I'm going to go directly to the warm up question for her, and then you can continue with uh, what you were discussing. I think we, we are already having a lot of uh, topics you want to touch. So as long as you talk uh, against uh, with each other, I don't have to moderate anything, which is good for me. So Sanja. Uh, you are very focused on making the experience of integrator users uh, smooth and easy. What are the biggest challenges you have found up till now? And I want to also ask integrator users, what does it mean for you? Are those developers, uh, users, non-tech users, DevOps? So, yeah. Please. I think that's such an awesome question because it hits on literally my answer, which is, the reason why building APIs or integrating or even developing is so hard is because we have a really complicated dictionary of terms. If you weren't exposed to these terminologies earlier, it's really difficult to know what they all mean. And that's part of the reason why entering the space is so hard. But to me, an integration user is the same as a developer. In fact, I think that everybody should be learning integration when they're going through some of these basic classes of Java 101, data structures 101, integration, then algorithms. Because you actually get to learn what kind of technology proficiency you want to focus on. You can either go all the way down the deep spectrum of back-end infrastructure and full stack development, or you can go all the way towards a more technology fluent converser but not necessarily engineering day in and day out. You have the sympathy that you need if you get this background as an integration a user. So it, when we look at making the experience of an integrator easy and smooth, what we really need to focus on is thinking about people who are entering software as their career path or as their interest for the first time and helping them find out which side of the spectrum they're ultimately gonna land on. The biggest challenge is that not a lot of people think about it like that. They, they, we've actually created this almost lack of democratic divide in it. Like, if you're going to be developing software, you have to be thinking machine learning algorithms, and you are a core engineer like that. And that creates animosity. And it's not right. Because everybody at the end of the day is contributing towards this software cloud mechanism. And that is ultimately where we see the most success. So I hope that you know all of us in this space are looking to be modifying, helping developers help each other. But also we gotta help developers be more open with each other and not you know build up our walls as much. And that's what we have to bring down. <clears throat> I agree. I, I it, it's sometimes it's hard to get the focus right, and sometimes it's hard. To... So um, I kind of interrupted uh, Gunnar and Omar, who were talking about uh, I don't remember what. So, uh, actually, I had a question for Christina because she was talking about serverless, and so why is it people are looking to scale to zero? So maybe you can. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, well, if you look at the current traffics um, of the internet right now, a lot of the services was not being used. And to serve those kind of functionalities, you still have to stood up your servers and they're just running empty. You're having a machine that's 
consuming CPUs, that's consuming RAMs. And then especially when you take the services onto the onto cloud and those cloud provider, they're charging you by the minutes that you're using it. That's the biggest um, trend of why people are moving it because they don't want to pay for that. But then I think the, the way that service started to um, become popular is because how easy it is for people to actually start writing applications. Um, before that, when they want to write application, you need to know how to build it, you need to know how to package it, and you need to know how to you know, do a lot of DevOps stuff. But with what um, I think the the I think the frontier is probably the Amazon um, Lambda. How they did things is very different. So what they did is they allowed this um, a way of develop, on, the developer only have to like write the code on top of a a GUI interface or something easy, and then they have the, this mechanism for the developer just quickly install that on top of the cloud. And that makes developer um, really happy because it's, it's, it's for them, it's like they don't have to care about what server they're running. And a lot of times that I said before that, you know, when, when, when I was in the uh, develop as a developer working for a company, a lot of times my, uh, my DevOps person, well, the person that's doing operations would ask me, hey, how much of a load were you expecting for to run your application? So I have to come up with a number because you know because they're buying the machine, they're buying the capacity, and I wasn't able to predict because I don't know how many people were using it. And um, that's like if if we it, if we can scale it freely uh, with scale to zero with optimization and scale it up, and that's gonna like eliminate that kind of problems for me. So that's why first of all developer joy, second of all, no, no more guessing work, right? And a lot more optimized. So that's why service becomes so yeah. popular. Yeah, that makes lots of sense. I mean, so the other day I was um, looking into this also a bit because what I wanted to have is a search functionality for my blog. And I thought, hey, if I, you know, stand up a server, as you say, running this all the time, this will cost me money. And I mean, it's my personal blog, so I get probably I will have like 10 requests per month. So I don't want to pay for that all the time. And I don't want to have this kind of security issue there, I need to keep this up to date. And so the serverless stuff definitely was very appealing to me. But then what I figured is, actually there's quite a learning curve. So as you say, the AWS Lambda stuff, it's, it's supposedly easy, but and still there's lots of moving parts involved, right? You need to know about Lambda, you need to know about the API gateway and how those things work together and about the um, IAM permissions. So for me, this was the biggest hurdle. How do I figure out what is the minimum set of permissions I need? So I figured that actually it's, it's still, I feel it must be still, you know, possible to simply simplify it somehow. I'm not sure how, but um, that, at least that was my um, impression from this little experiment I did. Maybe. Yeah, and other than that, I think a lot of complaints coming from the offside as well, because um, if look at how they were maintaining all these different services, right? If you're maintaining a lot of services using like Amazon services or you need, using the container services and using Lambda is a different story because Lambda doesn't show you where the containers are running, what so you're maintaining two different set of scripts to actually do that, that kind of thing. So that's like another way that people don't like about it. And that's why I think the Knative becomes so popular because it allows that capability of running everything serverless on the container side. So the ops can be easily running everything in the same way as, you know, like the traditional services, but you're actually doing something serverless right now. So I think that's why, like, um, I strongly recommend people to look at that yeah. because, you know, for a developer, there's not much change you need to do, right? So all you need to do is write your code and push that onto cloud. And then for the ops, it's the same, the similar thing where you're doing the same, oh, you know, container management, right? So I think that's- My, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, My, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, Omar, go ahead. I mean, I, because of this scale to zero thing, I had this kind of, this kind of issue. I said to myself, well, let me try Knative. I mean, it was like a few months uh, I get myself, I get my hands dirty on it. And I'm, I'm so, I'm very impressed. I mean, the idea itself is this very appealing because I had this issue like a few months ago or something. Like my, uh, my Azure bill was like, I forgot to switch off like a container. <laughs> no, because, yeah, like some pots. And I'm like, oh, they, oh they, <laughs> I have to pay like 200 euro, but, like for nothing. But, but seriously, I mean, something like Knative, I think, it really have like a good future because this is like one of the issues that I always see that is actually, a, it, it solves a problem, I see it. Especially the serving part. And the eventing part, I could be a bit skeptical about, but the serving part I'm very convenient about, uh, convinced about. Maybe we should talk a little bit about what Knative is because I feel like not everybody might be aware of it and what kind 
of servers well, flavor that is? If they have been for the camel integration track, they should be aware by now, more or less, what can they Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, See, I didn't, so. <laughs> Yeah, ex explain a bit because maybe some people just enter this. Uh, Christine is the best here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so really, what I like what? about this, it, it's the container based flavor of serverless, right? So you don't think about your serverless function in yeah. terms of a Lambda specific interface or a GCP cloud function interface, all those kinds of proprietary things. Really, you think about it in terms of, a, well, an HTTP API, which you expose via a Linux container, and this is as standard as it can be, right? And this is what I personally like a lot about this um, Canadian stuff because then you're just not locked into any kind of platform. You have all the portability. And for instance, this is very interesting if you think about moving stuff and moving your workloads um, also to the edge, right? So there's um, what I find very interesting providers coming up, which essentially tell you, okay, so we take your container and your, um, you know, your container-based serverless workload and we put it to different locations around the globe and then you know, it's behind some sort of um, load balancing, let's say, I'm not an expert on that. But then really, depending on where your user is, they will es essentially invoke the serverless um, um, API on the nearest location to them and gives them the, uh, lo a low latency and those kinds of things. So I feel this is definitely, as we talk about the future of all this, um, I feel this is where this might be headed, pushing stuff to the edge and, um, you know, giving people those kinds of increased um, qualities of service, let's say. Yeah, I, I don't know if maybe it's because I entered integration, uh, the integration area field very recently, but I have the feeling that uh, without all these uh, serverless can native being able to run containers and uh, start and stop services very quickly, maybe integration before this was difficult to achieve because it was more, um, I don't know, maybe it's my feeling that it was like five, 10 years ago, it was more difficult to interconnect things, but now it's like everybody is trying to be more, uh, to go in the same direction, uh, offering services, trying to be more compatible with each other and it's easier to integrate or is just my impression that integration has become easier in the recent years? I mean, I think it's uh, one thing it's about like, the evolution of REST APIs, and you have the evolution of JSON, the evolution of Crew, and then you have this new RPCs and have new like uh, like uh, gRPC. So new. I mean, they are now de facto coming in, and more embracing for procedure calls. So that also I think simplifies the whole thing. And also now the the, the fact that we have so many services. Before maybe you had you had like in one machine you have like one giant I don't know like system. You didn't, Exactly, but now I don't know. Like in, in one Kubernetes cluster, you could see like I don't know how many pods. It could be like two, three hundred pods that you need to integrate them together, or sort of integration could happen there. So, yeah, to complement to complement exactly what you just said, Omar, is that before you had to manage literally from designing and developing all the way to deployment of your integration, and now more and more people are trying to abstract away from those concerns. And that's part of the beauty of serverless. That's part of the beauty of the cloud. But at the same time, it doesn't abstract away the fear of the cloud. And I think that's the next big, next big hurdle for integration in general is trusting the cloud, trusting the process, trusting the management that comes with it. Because then the core thing you get to continue to focus on is how long do I need to have this integration with this? How long is this connection gonna really help my business? And if it doesn't, how am I going to quickly spin up, spin down, or remove this altogether? Because it may hurt me in the future. And that kind of evolutionary thinking and mindset is where most of this development type of person should. But we're still a little far from that because we don't trust the process yet. Yeah, true. yeah, we have a question on the chat. This uh, Al Joshi, he's asking or she's asking. I have no idea. Sorry. Uh, how do you advise running data pipelines on cloud, which require gigabytes gigabytes of data load from a database not necessarily on cloud? It is viable with the amount of data ingress cost on cloud platforms. That's interesting, I think, because not everybody has their data on the cloud already or uh, available and 
just thinking on uploading it to an to the cloud to be able to access it is is a cost that maybe not everybody is willing to do or willing to take so i think every every cloud platform has its own fix like for example bigquery the trick is partitioning <laughs> that's the magic word you know you have to partition your data and i think right now they only allow like you you can partition by date or i think by a, like a string um so it's difficult but for example every time that we have to deal with big, big you know huge amount of data you have to partition by a date or, or by a random id that you generate because otherwise every query that you you, you do over the table, it charge you, they, they charge you for the whole amount. But if you partition, then they only charge you for the partition that they access. So that's a very good trick for, for example, managing, um, yeah, consuming so data from the yeah. query without running into like huge costs. So you, you can also consider the Sorry, Sorry? The question. Uh, you propose is uh, uploading to the cloud, but just partition it so you are not uh, charged with accessing the full data or, or uh, yeah. But, yeah, fragment data. Exactly, that's, that, that's how it works behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the you can consider, sorry. Oh, sorry, Maria. I was going to say you can consider CDN caching as well because oh. caching will actually help protect another layer of that uh, partitioning and fragmentation. So that way, let's say you don't actually have data available, then you actually go and hit that core system. So the expenses do come down and at the CDN level, they actually cache it for you. And that helps with your performance, that helps with the retrieval, that helps everything. And in fact, we've been doing that for some of our open data platforms um, with Salesforce and Millsoft and Tableau. And CDN caching pretty much saved us in terms of like gigabytes and literally gigabytes of load. I mean, uh, and, uh, I, well, last time I checked, getting your data into the cloud mostly is not that expensive, right? And um, ingress even might be free, but getting your data out of the cloud, that's where it's getting expensive because, well, they don't want to easily let you go. Um, so that's why I always feel if you are about to do this, you put your workload into the cloud, you, from day zero, you should have um you know a plan in your drawer how to move away from there either on prem again or at least to another cloud right so you should at least be aware what does it actually cost me to uh, to to take my data out of um, a specific cloud and move it elsewhere and also how do you actually do it but what does it imply in terms of downtime or service quality so how do you actually do this i feel people are sometimes not aware of this enough so it's so easy to get your data and your workload into the cloud and you know it's it's it's, it's a happy path to do but then what to do next so how do you prevent being confronted with lots of costs um later on if maybe you would like to have this data elsewhere so I feel that's something to be aware of yeah <laughs> so you all propose to upload the data to the cloud and not try to get the process into the to get the process closer to the data, but the data closer to the process of integration. That's... Uh, I would say it's more like a direction uh, from the... From the so from the looks of the the questions, it looks like they have a huge amount of data that's already in store in their enterprise, right? So the, what they're saying is that we how how do we try to upload this data onto the cloud since we have some processings already running on the cloud, right? So I think the the best thing is to do some extraction, say a way to extract your data, part of your data. Don't do all of it because there may be security concerns, cost concerns, and a lot of that, right? So the way to extract your data onto the cloud. And then having it like what uh, Sanja says, maybe caching it or doing something else, you know, just having it to be extracted there. And then I think the, it's not like us, we trying to have the services running locally. We can do that too, but it looks like they're already having the services running on the cloud already, or it's, it's been like provided by the providers. So I think it's more like how do we extract the right amount of data and to actually do the, the, do the right amount of execution, right? That's. I think that's how you probably want to tackle that. Sometimes, honestly, this question of terabytes of data in the cloud, it kind of strikes me in my in my brain that if I'm a company that I have millions and millions that I'm capable to have it in front, why is it a, why is it a problem? For example, now as Donna said, you get you get you put you get it out, that's an issue, right? 
and we are talking here about data like I don't know like Hadoop data. That we are we are talking about tera 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 bytes of data maybe back for 15 years. And then I will be questioning myself: Is this really needed to put it in the cloud? And that's uh, one of the questions that I always have in my mind: Is it really needed that we have this kind of data? I mean, if your company have this amount of data, of course you have the capabilities to have your on-prem. I mean, at least for for this kind of data. I don't know. But I mean, things add up over time, right? So just if you think about a data warehouse, so maybe your current data set, sure, you can handle that. But then if you would like to be able to go back five years or 10 years and do some sorts of analysis, maybe you don't have the resources to do that one locally, right? So whereas if you put it, I don't know, to some big query, Snowflake, whatever data warehouse in the cloud, well, it um, gets a possibility. I guess that's one reason for people to do that. Yeah. And what if you internal process that up, uh, update the data so you have to keep like two copies one offline one online in the cloud so I, I see challenges if that not all the use cases could be able to just upload the data to the cloud and handle it there maybe maybe there are use cases you just have to uh, have the main uh, repository of data locally and then have to update or something but well I, I I really challenge the role of data duplication and the need to have it. There is a certain amount, I guess like you can you can categorize this into two spots. One being data that you need to have retrieved quickly and data that can be archived. And you should be able to know which is like data that you don't need to retrieve regularly, and that should be moved on premises. But if you're duplicating where data exists, you're actually creating more of a problem for yourself later because you don't actually know where the importance of what you need lies. And so much of integration in general relies on being able to contextualize what you need and when you need it. And you can always move the data fluid fluidly between it, but you just need to know when you need it and how often you're gonna need it. If you need certain, you will need certain amount of data less frequently and that should live on premises. You're gonna need sensitive data for a short period of time frequently, and that's to be tokenized. Uh, you just shouldn't have to duplicate where the data exists because then you just don't know where to go. Yeah, on the top, they are suggesting, uh, Fred Ross, that uh, maybe you can pre-process uh, the data and then uh, upload only that pre-processed data to the processing in the cloud, that uh, this is not happening in particle physics, that, that could be an option. Today, uh, I, was, I was actually, sorry, I was reading an article today and they were saying about this change of paradigm of instead of ETL is now ELT, because there's, because now like storing things in the cloud is so cheap that you don't, you don't no longer need to say, you know, be very, very careful about what you store there. So it's more about, okay, I, everything in there, you have databases that cost very little for storing huge amounts of data. And once there, then, then you, because you have more and more analytical capabilities there as well, you can run your transform processes and the, what used to be pre-processing, you process it directly in the cloud and then, and then you load it somewhere else the already processed data but that you know the transform now happens in in the cloud which i think is a very good i think it's, it's a very good way of, of of sort of visualizing the change of paradigm of what these clouds are offering so as well, I think Connor, you should own this pro this problem right because i think that's why change that capture has become Yes, it tells you what's going on with your data and uh, anything that happens, it, it just sends out that event and all your system gets that notification of, hey, this is what happens to my data. And you were able to capture that real time. And so your, your services will be able to actually process that, you know, at the time of what how that happens. Right. So I think this is why the, the BZM got so popular is because of the way that people are changing the way they process data. They want to have a uh, more distributed way of doing things. It can be like in-prem or on cloud 
or whatever that was, but you will be able to get that event, right? Anybody subscribing to that particular change would have access to that and then be able to react up, up on that, right? So that's like, isn't that like the heart of the BZM and how that would solve a lot of problems? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could also think about it uh, like essentially it helps you to create different views of your data, right? And which are optimized for specific use cases. So maybe you would like to do a full text search on your on your um, operational data. And typically, <coughs> sorry, relational databases are not so good at doing that, right? So instead, you would like to use something like Elasticsearch for your full text search. And well, um, CDC and DBS was a way for making this. Um, um, move of data from your operational database into something like Elasticsearch or Solar or whatever, and then people can use those optimized services to solve this particular problem, full text switch. Or maybe they would like to keep an audit trail of their data, like who has changed data and what was their use case for doing so and so on. So again, keeping track of changes from a database and then maybe storing this in Kafka or something else, um, essentially is a means of uh, having an audit trail on the data. Exactly, it's, uh, as Peter said, it's like, publish, subscribe, right? So we just publish the data changes and we don't really care um, how people are using this or what their use cases are. Um, it's, it's up to them. And if you look at Kafka, you can keep data there for a long time. You could even think about keeping a topic with an infinite retention provided you have disk space, you can do that. And then you can set up consumers and they can come up like in one year from now and they can read the change data topic from the beginning and you know uh, push the data to whatever data um, store they would like to use now. Maybe, um, I don't know, another data warehouse or a uh, craft database. Maybe there's some sort of use case which you know really can be done very well in Neo4j, let's say. Well, then you can take the data put it into new 4 j and then run your the query there. And the CDC process will keep, the, keep those things in sync. So it's not like a shared transaction. I mean, people don't really fancy this anymore, but it's basically it's with a near real time aspect or low latency. So just to give one example, um, people from the company I know which are using TPC, they have their data um, between the point in time when it changes in their operational MySQL database and until the point in time it's in their BigQuery data warehouse, it's um, about two seconds. So they can reason about their data with all the means they have in BigQuery within two seconds. It's like a really um, low latency um, uh, change data capture pipeline. Yeah. On, the, on the chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, they are yeah, that's a great point by, by Fred. Don't build a system that expects read after write consistency. That's absolutely true. I mean, and this applies to event sourcing in general, right? Um, and, and, and that's actually why I'm such a big fan. Well, I work on that, but I think it makes lots of sense to use a relational database as the canonical source of truth and then propagate changes to consumers um, asynchronously from, from there because the database it will exactly give you that. The, consistent read your own rights. So once a transaction has been committed, you do another query the next second, you will be guaranteed to see this data. Whereas if you put data, for instance, to something like Kafka first or Kinesis, um, well, you consume from there in asynchronous fashion. So this means if you query for your data the next second, you might or you might not be able to see it. And this can make for an interesting user experience depending on your use case, right? So just think about this case, you place an order, well, would you like to be able to see this order in the list of your orders like the next second, or would you be fine with this purchase order not showing up there like the next second? So that's, that's also a business matter which you need to think about, right? So what kind of guarantees would you like to give to your users? I want to ask one question because uh, before we run out of time, because it looks like we just started, but we have been here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, we are talking about a lot about the, the present, the current state of the integrations, how the hybrid cloud, the serverless, reactive, all these kind of stuff that are interesting. But in five years' time, or let's not talk about time, uh, how do you see, because this is a panel on the future of uh, software integration, what are the challenges you think we are going to face in the next months, years, and how would you see those challenges being overcome or solved or work around it. I mean, I, I see a lot of problems, for example, when uh, the amount of data we are handling, it, it's getting bigger and bigger with uh, IoT, smart cities, uh, a lot of uh, sensors adding data to many fields, uh, a lot of uh, crowdsourcing. 
I, I see a challenge there with the, the size or the amount of data we handle, but I don't know if you see other challenges in the future and how do you think they can be solved? I don't know if any of you wants to jump in. Uh, I think the first one is management. Again, we're not very good at once we pushed something out and it's live, like taking something down is really hard. Deprecation, end of life, just managing our own technology debt. And if you don't know what you build, what you put out is really hard to keep track of. Um, I would probably say that's our biggest challenge, but like there are going to be more and more apps coming, more and more systems to connect to. If we continue to do brittle integration, brittle connection one to one and forget that it exists, you, we just wouldn't be able to scale what we need to build because we're too busy maintaining what we already have and hoping to change and move what we have into something that we need for that moment of time. So I think management will continue to be our biggest hurdle. Yeah, maybe a related one uh, to that I see is um, testing, right? So, I mean, um, setting up an integration flow, that's really easy. And you connect, I don't know, your Salesforce to your Slack channel and then whatever. Uh, but then how you do uh, even um, test this, right? And how do you make sure if you reconfigure things and you change the details of that, that it still is doing the right thing? And also considering what um, kind of persona is um, doing this, right? So um, maybe we think about this kind of citizen developer. So this broadens the range of people who work on that but it also puts more responsibility to them right so they need to make sure this is tested and there are no regressions so that's an area i feel needs more exploration to make sure we have a good data quality essentially maybe maybe the testing could be solved and i'm going to throw a very random idea here with machine learning and uh, having something that monitors the kind of responses or the kind of outputs you are getting for the integration so if something radically changes they it warns you maybe random very random question random idea it sounds a bit like uh, monkey testing right and, and uh, uh, adding all sorts of random data and see what's happening yeah yeah, it, it's also a bit of black box testing. Um, we created an automation framework to, so you wouldn't have to build tests manually. You could just put in a, a data, see whether what pops out is good or bad and mark it. And black box testing is, is very similar to that. You don't really care what happens on the inside as long as the input and the output are what you desire. Right. To me, it's more like observability. Um, I think it's it's one big issue because currently everything is on the cloud and you don't really see. And the more and more people adopting the event-driven architecture, right? And so now you have all this event going back and forth inside your system. And it's really hard to see where they go and who's describing to it. And there's not e there's no easy way to see all that happening, right? And there's this way to, and the other one is discoverability, right? How do I discover all the services, right? I, if, if it's with the that cross cluster hybrid cloud all that kind of stuff how do we allow that and e and even with discoverability like how do we know what type of data uh, do i need to provide to this particular channel or topics or whatever that is consuming right that's really hard to see and i think one of the the, the thing that sdo took off is because the uh, the way that people can see how the data is flowing from one point to the other they were able to trace it they were able to see what's going on what's holding up things but with now the whole serverless and eventing and all that, how do we see what's where's the bottleneck? How do we find it, right? So I think that's something that um, we it's, it should be coming in the future. I think it should be there um, so that you know, like like Sanja said, we don't like um, spend a lot of time and effort just to maintain our products, right, or or our, our applications. For me, it's uh, actually the learning curve. That's one thing that. I think it's quite really important we shouldn't forget because many, many engineers, they really, when they see all this thing about cloud native and all this, they freak out. They really freak out. They say, no, I'm, I'm happy to stay with my own VM. I fire up my, my, my MySQL and I'm happy with that. And Spring Boot, um, I, that is, it's enough for me. I think I would foresee in the future, this integration will be very, very easy. Meaning that this, the whole thing will be managed services. 
I think that it's just about a click. But now it requires a bit of setup. It requires a bit of knowledge. I mean, I wouldn't say a bit of knowledge. Actually, it requires some knowledge, for example. But I think this thing will be more and more appealing that you don't need to know the underlying, like underlying technology. For example, you don't need to know how Kubernetes work. Or you don't need to know how this integration of this technology works. Just have your operators. I think like now, um, at, or like the operator hub, which is very appealing. I would say this is like a, a good start for a bright future. And I foresee this thing will be even more and more appealing in the future. It's just about the matter the here and there, and then I'm done. And then you can get billed for this operation, for example, for this operator. I think for me, the the future of integration, <laughs> um, I guess it very related to what you're saying, Mary, I think it will have to do a lot with the amount of data because I don't think it will be feasible anymore to just take everything that, you know, all the data that we store in the cloud, say, I don't know, terabytes and terabytes of data and extract it and take it somewhere because it wouldn't, it, it won't make sense anymore. And I think that's also very related to what, uh, with what Una was saying earlier about processing the, da the data in such a way to, op you know, to optimize it to, to the consumer, basically, you know? So I think it will be more related, to, you know, about maybe maybe creating I don't know processes like user-defined functions in in the database or something that you use to transform the data in such a way that you can later consume it in you know in your system in a particular way that it's optimized for that um, something like that and an example like something in Carto that we use for is um, map tiles no which is you take you you, you start I don't know terabytes of data in in BigQuery, for example, and then you transform it in, in map tiles that you later consume. So we are not extracting the data and then visualizing it on a map. We we extract and you know we transform the data directly in the in the database and then take what we need. So I think that probably that's how I see things evolving. I think it's interesting because. Uh, all of you come from uh, very different um, backgrounds, <laughs> use cases or very different uh, focus fields. I mean, especially yeah. you, Margara, you come from the spatial field, which is a very specific one. Mm -hmm. And I think the spatial field has a, a specific problem with uh, the, the amount of data the, 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 because having to store all those satellite images and having to store all the, the data positioning objects, it's a very specific use case. So I, I totally understand that your main focus is we cannot store all this on the same place. We have to fragment it. We have to separate it somehow. We have to handle this somehow. It's yeah, I think that's, that's a, actually knowing your use case and understanding your use case helps like in whichever field. So I see there's a lot of chat, but not many questions <laughs> in the chat. We got sidetracked by the question, what's the real camera? Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> we are uh, yeah. the last 15 minutes of the panel, unless you want to keep it running. So uh, if you have any question or you want to comment something and jump into stage, you know you are completely free to do so, to ask questions or to jump here to comment something. Uh, I might have miss this part but i do have a question which is we at mulesoft always think about integrations and apis as hand in hand and some of the questions that we were talking about scaling and retrieving data can also be thought of between rest apis and graphql are those things that have popped up in your peripherals and in your radars and do you think about that from an integration lens or how do you think about it I think um, I've been talking to a lot of customers and you know a lot of people that's trying to do the transformations. So yes, I think it's still a lot. There's there's still a lot of them uh, involving APIs and RESTful calls and you know else with other current enterprise users. So they do. Um, but what I'm seeing is that people people already have 
some of or most of the people that's doing that already, like for the last two or three years, has already accomplished that. So I think the problem right now is how do we scale it? And people finding that the RESTful or the API services is not enough because it's um, synchronous call. So there's limitations about that. That is why um, I see a lot of people are moving towards the event-driven uh, world where things can be broadcast a lot easier and it's a lot easier to share around the data and all that. So that's kind of what I see today is that people are moving on. So API is still important, but it's more towards the external communications and, you know, like uh, like a boundary setting contract. But um, I'm seeing more and more people doing the um, streaming eventing because of Kafka, of course, like the Kafka just took over and then now you're seeing everybody doing that. So that's kind of the trend. I mean, where I see GraphQL coming up in our community um, is um, when people think about streaming data changes to a browser, right? And um, so actually you can quite easily do this either directly using CDC and go to GraphQL directly. And there's this notion of um, subscriptions, which allows you to push data to a browser. So people can quite easily build like a push based update of, I don't know, a chart in a browser or whatever, some sort of alerting, let's say. Um, and actually what, what I like about it really is that it kind of unifies uh, your pull-based APIs uh, and your push-based APIs in GraphQL. You, you know, you define your schema of your types once, and then it's just a matter of how you set up this um, API. Do you have, you know, like a traditional query-based endpoint or this kind of subscription? Whereas if you do a REST-based API, well, then you would have to think about using something else, right? Like um, server sent events. To me, it feels there's a bit more friction, whereas in the GraphQL push and pull based, it's really quite easily unified. That's definitely something I like about it. So we have a question on the chat. Uh, Fred Ross, again, thank you for being so active, Fred. How much of a divide did you see happening between engineers behind the curtain doing managed services and those doing integration? Because it's true that sometimes there is like a separation between those two and even have conflicted interests. So what do you think about this? Well, so you mean the one developers doing the services themselves and then there's another population? Yes, do you think the, the, the integration uh, engineers and the managed service engineers, are they two uh, faces of the same coin? Are they maybe uh, completely different uh, teams uh, are they going to be separated the people that are um, doing all the integration stuff and the people doing all the managed services i don't know speaking from my experience i've seen the separation between two teams happens during the enterprise service bus days you know, when they you have a team that's doing all the integration with enterprise service bus, and then you have the teams that are doing the services. That's like the time when I see there's a big um, two like there's two big teams doing all the different things. So you get this team doing all the integrations, this team doing all the services, and they're like two different they're enemies to each other mostly <laughs> because they don't want to do any changes, and the other team wants to do a lot of integrations. Um, but I currently, if you if you see more like greenfield teams. I'm starting to see less and less of this divide. I see a lot of people doing the same thing, like the people that's creating the services and is also doing the integration content as well. So, um, so I, I don't see, I don't think I, I have a big big enough pool to kind of categorize people, but that's kind of what I feel like what I see today. It's a bit like DevOps essentially, right? So you have yeah, like cross functional teams and people work more closely together, I guess. I was going to say this, and uh, maybe it's meant uh, like a default. But I think this this thing, as as Christina said, I think it's, it's more and more getting like like getting together now. I mean, uh, like these side of things, it doesn't work anymore, especially with these references and the and the cross border context that doesn't work anymore. So that's why you have this kind of easy tools like Knative that the developer should be able to manage their, their services. So they shouldn't rely on another engineer or DevOps to to you know, to publish these services. So that, that's that's the target. The target is that you don't have any obstruction. You don't, you don't have any obstacles. You just go and publish your own service. So um, I think I sorry. Oh, sorry. 
Sorry, Maria. I was going to say that I actually still see the divide happening, which is why, Christina, I'd love to know more about the green fielding teams you see. Because for me, I find that the difference is actually one group focuses on the sexiness of the implementation, for lack of a better word. Like they want to have an elegant technology solution put in place that, you know, saves them lines of code and something else. And then on the other side, it's the people who are like, okay, this needs to be usable. It doesn't have to be delightful. And that divide is actually continues to happen it, from my radar and my perspective. I don't think that, I think as technologists, we forget that the people who will ultimately consume our technology, whether it's immediately or in five years, will definitely not be as technology fluent as we are. They won't care that we put in this architecture to make it this kind of scalable. They'll just care that I was able to retrieve what I needed. I was able to see the information that I needed. And if I can't, everything else is irregardless to me. So the divide between those two types of people is who cares about making the delightful uh, outcome a reality versus who's gonna make the best architecture, the computer theory a reality in the shortest amount of time. And I feel like at some point in time, if we really want to make technology, internet, data consumable, one, one side of the table would have to swallow their desire or their pride to really make that a reality. Follow up question for this. Unless Margara wants to say something. No, I was just going to say that Maybe it's a case of, you know, the technology is there for that divide to disappear, but maybe people are not ready yet. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, because at the beginning, Sanja was uh, talking about the kind of users that uses the integration frameworks, libraries, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, could you see uh, more, maybe more DevOps or more, um, Backend engineers starting to use integrations than analysts of data or uh, people that want to that are not so tech uh, and they just want to use this for integration integrating processes without much uh, thinking much about how to do this. I mean, because also the the kind of user that is going to be the integrator, I think changes a lot the 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 answer to this question because if if you are going to if your integrators are going to be very technical people, then this, I think this, 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 this difference dilutes a lot because they are in the end the same people that create the services and the same, the same engineers that develop the rest of the things. But if the integrators are going to be people that are not engineers, that are not developers, that are completely separated from the tech world, maybe that changes a bit the, the, the answer to this question, at least from my perspective. That's a good question because I heard, um, at least from Garner's and a lot of analysts, they were saying the, this persona uh, integrators, right? So I heard a lot about it. Um, but like in real life, like personally, I've never, well, I met one or two of them, like actually, because um, they don't really know how to code, but they actually do the integration stuff. But mostly what I see is that. Um, People are still doing a lot of developments, and maybe it's not hardcore, you know, to the DevOps side where you do. Still have some knowledge of, um, and I think they're they're willing to learn. They're willing to you know dive deep into how everything works, right? So, I still that's like the most of the that's the majority of people I see today. Like that they're they're starting with something simple, um, but eventually they would you know, deep dive into something that they're interested in, right? But then uh, now, I mean, I see like more GUIs for integration. Like for example, my company in Thailand, we have this integration platform that is just drag and drop. And then you have non-technical people actually doing the integration. I mean, I could, st I, I start seeing this now, at least. So but what do those people do, let's say if there's a performance problem? So how do they go about it? There is a feedback button in Thailand says, just call us. <laughs> 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 nice, nice business model you found. Um, but I mean, that's a bit the, the problem I always see. It. Sometimes it seems like we are just re 
doing the same stuff over and over at different layers. Um, yeah. Because there's always a trade-off between the flexibility people can have with those tools and how easy it is, right? So then, you know, you had the scripting language because people felt with the original UI kind of stuff, it was too limited. So they now they do some scripting. And then, you know, this opens all those questions, like how do they test? How do they go about performance um, analysis? How do they go about CI? And, you know, it feels like they are just doing the same things at those levels, which maybe even did before at the Java level. And um, I'm, I'm wondering how much do we gain actually by, by doing this exercise? Um, but I totally also understand there's this matter, of course, of, you know, getting started easily and, and, and the learning curve. So I see that. But I think this kind of tool yeah. are targeting different audience. I think they are more targeting like more people, businessy that, you know, they just want to have A and B and they don't even bother about CI or something. They just click start and then done. I, I don't know. That's that's only my own impression about this. That's how it starts, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. For, for what I've been able to see is like, you can put a thousand GUIs on top of literally every process, but unless you actually break down the dictionary and translate it into like human layman terms, People won't ever be able to learn about things like performance. Like, like if somebody is new to integration and they're only getting one transaction per second, would they be able to know that that's a performance issue? Like, how do they gain that context? If we don't educate in our platform in that behavior, then that product maturity curve, that onboarding curve gets deeper and steeper. And that's actually where all of our products probably are today. And like you can do a phone home to talent support at any time and ask about that performance term, but that's not going to help you actually learn and identify the fact that you have a performance concern. And that's like 50% of the battle. You need to identify in order to act on it. And if our products don't help you identify an issue or suggest that it could be an issue, we won't ever mature this generation of integration development. So we are finishing the panel. I'm sorry, because this has been very interesting. Uh, maybe you want to do a quick round of one minute conclusion, each of you, starting with Guna. <laughs> uh, yeah, not sure what to say. I mean, yeah, thanks for me. It was uh, definitely in insightful. I mean, so this point, which we just discussed uh, last, this definitely is on my mind, right? So. Uh, how do we, as Sandra is saying, how do we provide users of those integration kinds of tools with the means of doing their job, right? So how can they be enabled to, to you know, do the performance testing and everything? So I feel that definitely going forward, that's something I know very need to, to have better answers. And maybe it's, it's, the answer is people should do more Java coding. I don't know, because we have the tooling there. Um, maybe we can invent something, um, but I feel that's definitely an interesting um, area where we will see more um, evolution. So, Omar? Yeah, uh, again, thank you for having him, having me here. I agree also with Gunnar, this is also one uh, one interesting area. You can also take it, take it offline later with Gunnar, because I've, I've, seen it in, I've seen it sometimes in my company, and it's also like a it's a, it's an obstacle. I mean, I would agree on it. It's a very big challenge, and I would see it that could, in the future, really get improved to enable like non-technical people just to jump in into integration, just do their own integrative work without worrying about any performance. So yeah, I think we have a bright future ahead. We won't run out of work. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, Christina. <laughs> All right. Um... Again, and thank you for having me here. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting, like um, to see the aspect from different people. That you know, I, I definitely agree that technology become is becoming a lot more easier than the traditional times where things are getting hard. You know, I you, I remember we used to write you know those like scripts and all that kind of stuff. I do believe it's going to get easier and easier. And um, yeah, so I think we just need to find a balance between the flexibilities and the easiness to be on board. You know, maybe how do we make the consuming of the technology a lot easier? Something that maybe we can look into, and you know, just a lot of things. Like it's it's great perspective from 
people, and especially like coming with the, especially with the data processing part um, that we discussed earlier, it's another interesting fact that I think people are not thinking enough on how to solve data problems, especially in the, in the current world. So it's really good takeaways. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Margara? Girls. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maria, for inviting me to the talk. It was really interesting to, to share other experiences with you. And I think I think there's something that we haven't spoken about, which is super important, which is data privacy. And I think that's probably going to be, in my opinion, the biggest challenge in integration because you mentioned briefly IoT, and I think that's something, I mean, we enterprise are consuming personal data of all of us. And there's a lot of integrators of, of that data as well. I think we haven't really managed how to deal with that. And technology is not ready and people are not, are not ready either. Uh, so yeah, I think that's my closing thought. <laughs> yeah, I agree. The privacy thing is something I, I had uh, noted, but I we didn't touch. And for the next panel, we can do another panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sanjay, final remarks? Uh, thank you for having me and uh, pardon my late arrival, but the thing to me is each one of you have had such a unique experience in, in terminology and what is important for the next generation of developers. And I would love to see how we actually help students who are studying computer science or want to be technical somehow to actually be successful in this field because there's still that divide. And there's no shortage of work here. And the more people we can encourage to be in this industry, the better it is for literally all of us because those diverse perspectives matter and they start to build other technologies that will become foundational. And diverse technology breeds diverse use cases, breeds more open and uh, comfortable technology for everyone. So that's what I'm looking forward to the most. The data privacy stuff, totally nailed it. It's not on my radar yet, but now I'm I'm provoked to think about it. Yeah, <clears throat> so thank you all. It has been really interesting, at least for me, even if I do dummy questions, just in case. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. Thank uh, the audience for staying in place. And see you on the lightning talks on the next uh, session, which I don't know which link it has, but Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you all.